Father, we thank you, Jesus. We just thank you on this amazing night, this beautiful night, Lord, that you allow us to live another day of life, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, as we continue this study with Genesis, Lord. Father, I pray that every time that we get on here, Lord, it doesn't become some routine that doesn't mean anything to us. Another day of just logging on the computer and hearing a message and just keep living the same way, the same life, Lord. I pray every time we read your word, whether it's on this Bible study, Father God, or by anything else, Jesus, that, Father God, of your word, Lord, that it would always change us, that it would always make us fall more in love with you, that it would always encourage us, build us up, strengthen us, correct us, do what it needs to do, Lord, to, to make us more like you, Jesus, Lord, in a world that's so dark, Lord. Help us to be more salt and light of the earth, Lord. And I pray every time that we get on this Bible study, when we pray and everything we do, Lord, that you would always be glorified, Father God, that it's never man's agenda. It's always going to be your agenda that we do on here, Father God. I just thank you, Jesus, for everyone that you would open their ears, their eyes, and spiritually, Lord, to hear and receive your word, Lord, that it would be planted in good soil in their hearts, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Anybody remember where we left off in the book of Genesis? What chapter are we on today? Anybody know? Other than our brother Joshua and Joshua and them, because they always first. Sally, perfect. Genesis chapter 20. Praise the Lord. All right, we're going to continue in Genesis chapter 20. Guys, there's about 50 chapters, so we're almost halfway there. I'm going to see if I can squeeze in three chapters of Genesis. For those is like, you know, you wonder why we're studying Genesis. Because how many have, have we seen that Jesus is all over Genesis? Amen. That Jesus is not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He is all in Genesis as well. Because sometimes we think, oh, no, brother, we got to focus back on Jesus. Jesus is the whole word. The, the, the Bible said that the word became flesh. So everything from Genesis to Revelation, it's all pointing to Jesus Christ. We need to know everything about Jesus. Amen. And uh, how many here have learned and, 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 and seen and we, we're learning things that I, I've learning things that I didn't even know in the book of Genesis. There's a lot of deep stuff in there. And honestly, I, I could probably go deeper, but then we'll never finish Genesis. But um, it's it's learning. There's so much to learn from this because the, re the reason why we're on Genesis and the, and the Lord put this in my spirit to study about Genesis, because Jesus said that the last days would be like the first days. What was the first days? The days of Noah, the days of Lot. So there's a lot that's going on in this world that you see. It's just a repeat of what happened in Genesis. A lot of things that are going on in this world currently right now. If you want to know why it's happening right now, it's rooted in Genesis. So it goes to show you, wow, so many thousands of years ago, because you, you think Genesis and, you know, Adam and Eve, you, you know, you're thinking about 6,000 years and 6,000 years later, the, the effects of what was written in this book. You still see it going on today. Isn't that amazing to show how the word of God is alive? That's something that started, you know, you know, estimate, you know, an estimate of 6,000 years ago, certain problems and issues and certain decisions people decided to make. It's still affecting today, 6,000 years later. Isn't that amazing? So we're going to continue on in the book of Genesis, chapter 20, verse one, Abraham and Abimelech. Verse 1, and Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said to said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. <laughs> Did we not just see this happen about, you know, eight chapters ago? Again, you got Abraham lying again. The guy who's the patriarch, the guy who's called the man of faith, the father of faith. Where's his faith multiple times that here we are again with Abraham making the same lie again, saying that his wife is his sister. Isn't this crazy? You would have thought that the first time he would have learned because the first time he lied, he lied to Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 12. He said, hey, this is my sister because he was scared that the Egyptians were going to fall in love with Sarah and kill him to keep her. So he lied and said it was his sister. Now, Genesis chapter 20, you know, the first time God had spoken to Pharaoh in a dream and said, hey, this is a married woman. You know, get rid of her. And God rebuked the whole situation. And, you know, that was in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 20, you have Abraham doing it again, but with the, the king Abimelech. 
when I was reading this, I'm like, how could you do the same sin and the same mistake twice? Like when you saw God come through for you the first time, well, it's no different from us. Amen. How many of us have made the same mistake, the same sin again and again, that if somebody looked on the outside and would say, how could you do this again? <laughs> right. How could you lie like that again? How many have ever been there where the very thing you told the Lord, you weren't, you weren't going to do again. And, and you could have swore was a learning experience for you. You commit the same mistake again. Amen. So this is, this, I love that, that God points out this twice. Like this, this is the second time Abraham lies about his wife being his sister because he's scared of dying. So, but yet he's called the father of faith. This is so important. I, I, didn't, I wasn't even going to go in this direction, but I feel the Holy Spirit is telling me to go in this direction. Because who we are in Christ is not rooted in the mistakes that we make. Amen? Who we are, our identity, it is not rooted on the things that we do wrong. Because if it was about that, <laughs> Abraham would be known as the guy who lies about his wife. But he's not recognized as that. He doesn't hold that title. Come on, y'all. He doesn't, he doesn't, it's not, nobody remembers, there's no name or association with him as the guy who lies about his wife. He is called the father of faith. When people think about Abraham, they think about the one that God made a promise to, to spread his descendants like the grains of sand, like in the ocean. This is the guy who everyone knows and sees as the patriarch, not the guy who lied so many times about his wife. So some of us, that's why I say when we're Christians, we don't call ourselves sinners no more. Why do we not call ourselves sinners anymore? Because we are now in Christ. We do not identify with our sin. We identify with Jesus Christ. And if we're going to identify with Jesus Christ, we will identify as his saints. Amen. We're not. So, you know, this. if you think about this, how much it must anger the Lord that he died for us. He shed his blood for us. He forgives us. The Bible says he remembers our sin no more. And we're identifying ourselves with, with, with sin. And we're identifying ourselves with our mistakes. You know, because that's what we do. And because why? Because we listen to the enemy. The enemy is always constantly reminding you of what you did wrong and making you feel that what you did is who you are. But who you are is not rooted in what you do. It's rooted in who he is and what he did. Amen. That's why when you accept Christ, that's the beauty of Christ, that you put on the righteousness of Jesus. You put on the holiness of Jesus because reality is which I don't even know I'm going this direction, but the Lord is, has me going in this direction because this is why a lot of Christians, we deal with condemnation. We deal with feeling not good enough. We feel like we're not spiritual enough. We feel like we're not clean enough. We feel like we're not perfect enough. We feel like we don't do everything Christ-like enough because we start focusing on what we do wrong. We start focusing on all the mistakes. We start focusing on, on all the things that we could have done better. But see, the thing is, God knows you could never do it better. God knows you can't do it every correct. He knows you're not going to do everything perfect. He knows, come on, somebody. He knows you're not going to do things, everything exactly like he would. But he did. See, Jesus did everything we could not do. He fulfilled what we could never fulfill. That's why when you accept Christ, you're not just accepting salvation. You're accepting his identity. You are ex accepting his clothing. You are accepting his spirit. You're putting on Christ. Why do you think the Bible in the book of Galatians says pull on the armor of God? Because you in your identity, what you wear is not enough. So when you put on Christ, you are putting everything about him on you. So when you identify with yourself, you don't identify with your mistake because he took your mistake on the cross. He took your sin on the cross and he cleans you of your sin. He cleans you of all of your mistakes. So think about this. You don't need to, oh man, this is amazing. You don't need to wear your sin on your face. You don't need to put here the person who messed up, the person who got divorced, the person who lied, the person who gossiped. You don't need to wear that on your life because he wore it. He put, he became sin to he who knew no sin. He became that 
for us. So why do we wear sin when he wore it for us and he died for it? He paid the price for it. But we want to carry our sin with us. We want to identify with our sin. We want to identify with our past. Because the enemy knows if you can continue to identify with your sin, your past, and your mistake, you will never be who he's called you to be. You'll never know everything he has for you, and you'll never be able to walk and operate in the calling and the anointing that Christ has in your life. So this is amazing from Abraham's day. So when we read the Old Testament, you see that the way that God deals with sin and people, it seems to be a lot harsher than he does in the New Testament because Christ hadn't been crucified yet. We hadn't received the grace yet, but you see here, Abraham continues to lie. <laughs> he continues to lie after the first time being rebuked. He lies again, but nowhere in the Bible do you hear God call him the liar. Nowhere do you hear him, the one who keeps lying about his wife. He calls him the father of faith. Amen. So this is what we need to start doing. Stop identifying with your sin. Stop identifying yourself as the one who used to lie, the one who used to be addicted to, to porn, the one who had the divorce. Don't be as the person who is the single mother, the single father, the single this, the one who, who failed, the one who got fired, the one who has this. We cannot identify what our failures and our mistakes. He took all of that on the cross. He took all of it on the cross to make you clean. This is the beauty of serving Christ, that no matter what wrong you've done, he makes you clean. He erases your record of wrongdoing. There is no record. Amen. You know how people, when they commit a, a crime, you go to a lawyer and you pay a certain amount of money to get it expunged, right? Isn't this crazy? Well, cra crazy thing is this. You don't have to pay nothing. He paid for it to erase your criminal background. <laughs> Isn't that the beautiful thing in Christ? In the world, you got to pay a price if you want your criminal background to be erased, which even then, it doesn't really get fully erased. Someone could do a deep search and still find out what you did. But see, the thing with Christ, it doesn't matter how much of a deep search anyone does. The blood of Jesus leaves no stain, leaves no hint of it. And he erases all of your criminal record of all your past as if you, th that's what a saint is. Isn't that crazy? If somebody searched you up and see you have no tickets, you have no speeding tickets, you've never been in jail, they call you a saint. Oh man, you're a saint. They say it as a joke. But see, the thing is in Christ, if they search you up now of all their mistakes, it's all been wiped away through the blood of Jesus. He's the one who, who cleared it up. So when they look it up, you are a saint in the eyes of Christ. But look, Abraham is not identified with his mistake. He keeps lying. <laughs> but with nonetheless, don't hear this and say, well, this is my excuse to keep lying. No, don't keep lying. Amen. Verse three, it says, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. Once again. Same repeat. And it said, and said to him, indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Look how big and serious the Lord takes about being or looking at a ma another married person's wife or husband. Don't do it. God, the way God views it is you're you're dead. You're a dead man. <laughs> and it says, but Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she even she herself said, he is my brother. So she lies too. <laughs> That's why brothers, well, men, you need to lead your wife in the ways of the Lord. You need to lead her because look, she will follow your lead. Amen. Women want to be led by a spiritual strong man. Amen. The reason why people say, oh, there's a lot of women who don't want to submit. It's not really women that don't want to submit. It's women who, who got tired of submitting to the wrong man. They got tired of submitting to a guy that they see does has no direction from the Lord. Us as men, we need to be able to lead in a spiritual way that when they follow, they see the fruit of God to say, okay, it's worth listening and following this person because when I do, I see God back him up. But if they follow you and it brings destruction, confusion, uh, loss conf and, uh, loss of direction, all this stuff, they're not going to submit to you. Amen? And it says here, um, and in the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. See, God will always provide a way for you not to sin. Amen? Isn't that the beautiful thing? That God, not only does he convict you from not sinning, but he also provides a way for you not to sin. The Bible says he provides an exit for you, 
out of temptation. How many of us you've ever been tempted and there has been exits provided for you so you you don't take it. So there's no excuse that you, God, I had to do this. There was no other way to do it. No, there was other ways to do it. God always provides a way out of temptation, out of sin. You don't have to lie. You don't have to do this. You don't have to. God will always show you. Amen. And it says here, for you withheld sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die. You and all who are yours. So that's how God views someone who takes a married man's wife and vice versa. It brings death. Amen. Whenever you you are coveting and, and Jesus takes it a step further. If you're lusting after someone who's married in the eyes of God, it, it will bring forth death. You know that there's levels to sin. Have you ever heard the term that? Hey, all sin is the same. Have any, has anyone heard that? We're like, all, all sin is the same. There's no such thing as a different sin. Anybody ever heard that before? How many of you do, do you believe that? That all sin is the same? Everyone except my wife. Don't answer. I love this church, man. <laughs> I see Brenda, Joshua, Christina say, nope, I don't believe that, man. This Sally, I don't believe that. It's a spirit-filled church. <laughs> Most Christians would say, yes, brother, all sin is the same. There's no such thing as a big or little sin. That is not true. And the reason why that is, is this. The Apostle Paul said, in two occasions, there's certain sins that lead to death and there's some that don't and the and paul said if you see your brother sinning in a way that doesn't lead them to death pray for them but he says if you see your brother sinning in a way that would bring him to death it says rebuke him confront him amen so there is levels to sin not all sin is the same Man, tonight's spirit filled. I was going to just go through this chapter, but I feel the spirit of the Lord telling me to go in this direction. So I'm going to go in this direction. Amen. So not all sin is the same. Why? <laughs> because even the even Jesus in the, in the word of God, the Bible says there are seven sins that the Lord hates and detests and is considered an abomination before the Lord. They are seven of them that the Lord considers an abomination. Amen. You guys want to know what they are? Let me look it up. Let me look it up. Give me one second. Let me see. Hold on. Hold on. Proverbs 6. I got to make sure to go back and not lose my place. Proverbs 6. These are the six things that the Lord hates. A proud... He goes, look, uh, Proverbs 6, 16. Highlight this. When someone says all sin is the same... He doesn't say this in the book of Proverbs. He says he says there's six that he considers the worst of the worst abomination. Proverbs 6:16. 6, These six things it says the Lord hates. Yes, oh no, seven. It says yes, seven. So there's six things he hates and seven are an abomination to him. You know what it is, an abomination that God is just disgusted with it because it's not normal. It's not natural. It's, it's, first one, a proud look. It says if you have a proud look, that means people look at you and you you act prideful. You have a proud look. According to the Bible, You that is an abomination. The next thing, a lying tongue. When you are lying, 
a lot. You lie about people. You lie about things. You Whatever it is, you're lying. God considers that an abomination. Hands that shed innocent blood. You know what that is? When you kill people innocently, that can be through abortion. That can also be when you're trying to kill somebody spiritually. Murder doesn't just happen physically. Do you know you can kill somebody? The Bible says that hating a brother is the same as murder. That if you have hatred towards a brother in Christ, the Bible says that it is the same as murder. So that is shedding innocent blood. Verse 18, a heart that devises wicked plans. That means someone who is constantly thinking about how to do something wrong, hurt somebody, make someone pay for something, you know, trying to do horrible things to somebody. It says a heart that devises wicked plans. It says feet that are swift and running to evil. That means the minute you hear gossip, you run to it. The minute you can stir up drama, you run to it. The minute you can go and, and steal something or, or, or go sleep with someone or you hear of drugs, whatever it is, that you run to evil. It's an abomination. And the, it says here, and the last one, a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. Oof, those are considered the worst sins in the eyes of God. A false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. So the person who causes drama amongst brethren or family members, church members, all this, it says the Lord hates Oh, but brother, I thought that I thought that God loves everyone. Reread your scripture. You won't see that. He hates these things. So there's no way you say that you are in Christ and you're doing these things. If you do these things, you are an abomination before the eyes of the Lord. You're not supposed to be sowing discord, shedding innocent blood, having a proud look, devising wicked plans, swift being swift to running to evil. These things are the sins that will bring death in your life. Paul makes it very clear. He says there's sins that lead to death. If you do any of these sins that are an abomination, according to the word of God, it will bring death in your life. Isn't that crazy? So let's continue on. So there's levels to sin. Levels to sin. And one of these are the, it's not an abomination, but it is a high level sin that God in the Old Testament, another person's spouse, wife or husband, you were considered a dead man. Right? And it says here, uh, verse 8. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants, and told all these things in their hearing. And the men were very much <coughs> it says, afraid. Oops, sorry, guys. My screen did something weird. Hold on. And it says here, And the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you? That you have brought on me, on my kingdom, a great sin. You have done so. See, a great sin. Even Abimelech understood that it was. this wasn't a small sin. This was a great sin. So yes, they are big and small sins. The, the only similarity between small and big sins is that regardless if it's small or big, if you don't repent, you're going to hell for it. So a crime is a crime. I'll give you a better example. So if I steal a pencil from you, right, would you consider that a sin that will lead me to death? If I stole a pencil from you and I didn't just, oh, that's a nice pen. And I took it. Would you guys consider that a sin that will lead to death in my life? No, it wouldn't. But if I slept with somebody's wife, if I murdered somebody, that could that would change my life forever. That's a sin that will lead to death. Those are the type of sins it's very hard to bounce back from. See, if I steal your pen, I could just give it back to you. <laughs> but if I murder somebody, I can't take that back. 
it will be very difficult to bounce back from it. Sleeping with somebody's wife or husband or coveting, it is very difficult to bounce back from it. Not that Christ won't forgive you because he can forgive you for it. But nonetheless, the repercussions, it can, it can it will cause more damage. And this is this is why there's a difference in sin regarding punishment. This is there's 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 people don't understand this. In hell, there's different levels of punishment. And there's Christians who will watch this video and say, Oh brother, why are you talking about negative things or talking about hell? Do you know that Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven? Did you guys know that? Christ talked more about hell and repentance than he did about going to heaven. He talked more about it. Why? Because people think that hell is not real. There's a lot of Christians who think hell is not real. There's people who think hell is on earth. There's people who think they'll be reincarnated. All these different things. This is not, this is not true. It makes you think twice about your sin when you realize that you're going to get a different level of punishment in hell. The same way in heaven, you will get a different level of reward. Amen. For the one that just goes to church and, you know, whatever he prays and lives right, believes in Christ, but does nothing. Yeah, he'll go in there, but there's no reward for him. But the one who serves and and, and does things for the kingdom of God, he will have a different level of reward. And in hell, depending on the amount of sin, you will have a different level of punishment. It's not all the same. <laughs> there's one person who might get cooked, you know, medium rare. And there's some people who will get well, well done. <laughs> You know, while there's some people in heaven that will get well done, my good and faithful servant, there'll be people in hell getting well done. <laughs> so this is why it's so important to know that there is. But Christians, they want to, you know, oh, brother, everything is the same. No, everything is not the same. It's not the same. Because even Abimelech said, it says, you know, on my kingdom, he goes, a great sin. All right, let's continue. To read. It says, you have done deeds to me that ought to be not be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you have in your view? that you have done this thing. And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. They will kill me on account of my wife. Once again, Abraham has a fear of death. <laughs> this is fear. <laughs> he, he's No one has done anything to him. And this is the second time after he's seen God show up the first time, the second time he's here fearing again. This is, it goes, I love this because it shows transparency in the, the greatest men of God. You will see transparency in their mistakes and it ministers to us because you see everything that Abraham accomplished and everything he became. But look at this. He, the same thing God came to hit through for, for him, he's fearing it happening again. Amen. So it, how many here you, you, God has come through for you in something and then you find yourself in that situation again. And you're fearing all over again. You, 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 you've had trouble at work before. God came through for you. Next time you get in trouble at work, you're freaking out again. Right? You, you can't pay your bills and God somehow miraculously gets all your bills paid. The next time that happens to you, you you're shaking and you're freaking out again. This, this is what happened with Abraham. These things are normal, guys. I think the the thing we're so hard on ourselves about our mistakes. We're so, I think we're sometimes more severe than we than than we, than God is trying to deal with us. Amen. God's punishment is going to be severe, in in the in eternity, but it's here. The Bible says D David said this. He goes, "Oh Lord, if you punish me truly according to my sin, he goes, who could survive?" <laughs> think about this. If God was going to severely deal with your sin. Right now, on earth, who could be alive? None of us. I don't care how great of a Christian you say you are. None of us would be here. It goes to show the mercy of God on our life. God has so much mercy on us. That's what Jesus did. Not only did he give you salvation and grace, but he pours out mercy. That The Bible says that the, the mercy of the Lord is new every day. Amen? But it's not an excuse or a license to keep you know, living wrong because God will see right through your motive and see what you're trying to do. And it says here, but indeed, she's truly my sister. <laughs> she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. So Abraham is like, technically, I wasn't lying because she's related in this form. <laughs> so that's like somebody saying, well, technically, she's my sister in Christ. So it doesn't See see how Abraham was trying to be manipulative and slick about his sin? Don't be like that. And it says, And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said, Sir, this is your kindness that you should do for me in every place wherever you, we go. Say of me, he is my brother. Then Abimelech, 
It said, took sheep, oxen, and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham. He restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, see my land before you dwell where it pleases you. Then to Sarah, he said, behold, I have given you, your brother, a thousand pieces of silver. So he's <laughs> he's calling him after knowing that that's not her brother. He's like, oh, yeah, I gave this to your brother. It's funny, right? And it says, and indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus, she was rebuked. So Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife and his female servants. You know, so we always believe that only in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and Acts in the New Testament, you see people healing somebody. But look, Abraham prayed to God. God heals Abimelech, his wife and female servants. So look, signs, miracles and wonders have followed his servants since the beginning. Isn't that crazy? This will actually come against the argument towards sensationists that the gifts were only for the apostles. Well, look at Abraham. It says he healed them. He prayed to God. God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Healed them from what? It says, then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. I'm going to give a teaching about that, about barren wombs. There's many reasons why some people cannot give have children. There's the reason of God is purposely not letting the person get pregnant because he wants a huge testimony to glorify God. It's going to glorify him, bring glory to him. It's going to be a huge testimony, right? And then the other one is because God is punishing you, right? Look, it says here, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. When sin is involved in your life, God can cause your womb to be closed up. It's not me making this up. <laughs> it's, it's, it's here in the word of God. So this is why this is why this may happen. Right. You know, sometimes people, we they put the enemy on everything. The devil is not in everything. God is in everything. That is why we must acknowledge God in everything. He'll make our path straight because he'll do what he wants to do, how he wants. I think people give, oh, it's the devil blocking someone from having being pregnant. No. God is behind it. Because see, someone would have told Abimelech, no, it's the, it's the devil, the demon that's blocking it. Well, it says there, it was the Lord who had closed up their wombs. All right, let's continue. Next chapter. Uh, it says, and the Lord visited Sarah, as he has said, and the Lord did for Sarah, as he had spoken for Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God has spoken to him. And Abraham um, called the name of his son who was born in him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son, Isaac, when he was eight days old, as God commanded him. Now, Abraham was 100 years old. Imagine that being 100 years old, having a kid. <laughs> Crazy. Look how much of a huge testimony. And this is a testify that I believe the Lord, and I'm going to talk about this on Sunday. God is behind difficulties. A majority of the time we think the devil is behind difficulty. It may just be Jesus Christ behind difficulties to bring himself glory. Isn't that crazy? That God, oh man, this is just, man, the, I just feel the Lord all over this. Sometimes the Lord himself will be the one who creates difficulty in your life. I'm going to do my best not to go in that direction because it's, it's my Sunday message. God will be the one behind your difficulty. Why? Because when it is over, <laughs> he will get all of the glory, all of the credit, and nobody can say that it wasn't God who did it. Amen? That when it's all said and done, people are going to say, wow, that was Jesus. Has anyone ever had that moment in your life that when someone is like, Dang, remember that difficulty? Remember how this shouldn't have happened for you and you couldn't afford this? And remember you were in this bad season for this amount of years? And when God says, okay, it accomplished what it needed to do in your life, that the, it, nobody will say, nobody's going to deny that it was the Lord. Because no one could deny that to Abraham. Imagine how long Abraham was telling people, yeah, the Lord promised me I'm going to have a child. And you know how people must have been looking at him and saying, what child, bro? You're old. You know, but look, when it happened, zoop, shut people's mouth. And I think the Lord is, he loves doing that, is shutting 
people's mouths. He shut Job's friend's mouth. He's shutting the people around Abraham's mouth. He will shut people's mouth who said you're not going nowhere, that you'll be nothing, that you're never going to have this or do that, man. He will shut their mouth. Amen. And it says, and, uh, and Sarah said, God made has made me laugh and all who will hear here will laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children for I have borne him a son in his old age. So the child grew and was weaned and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that, that Isaac was weaned and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian. So this now Isaac is born, but don't forget Abraham has another child that's, that's lingering around. That's Ishmael. That's the one that he out of once again, having no faith, going and sleeping with Sarah's maid servant. He thought when God promised that he needed to make it happen. So that is the son that actually came from his own rebellion. And it says here, therefore she said to Abraham, cast out this bond woman and her son. <laughs> so all of a sudden they have a kid together and she's like, yeah, get rid of her and her kid. We don't need her no more. And it says, for this woman shall not be the heir with my son, namely with Isaac. Why? Because God made a promise and a covenant with Abraham uh, with his seed and his descendants, that they would they were spread, that there would be so many descendants out of his seed. So Sarah was like, no, like sh she can't be a part of this, right? Your side chick can't be a part of the promise of God, right? And it says, and the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. So God is telling him, your seed through Isaac, I have a promise. But because this is the amazing thing about the Lord's promises, regardless of what you do right and wrong, God is still faithful to do what he said he's going to do. Amen. Because clearly Abraham does the wrong thing and God still has keeps true to his promise about whoever comes from his seed. And then you have him actually do the right thing with his own wife and have Isaac. And God's still going to do what he said he was going to do with this child. So technically, so you got Isaac and Ishmael. They're both going to fulfill what God promised of spreading their descendants. Now, the only thing is one will produce the righteousness and what God originally planned. One will end up going in a different way that it's not the way it should have gone originally. And then that's why I tell people there's the perfect will of God and the permissible will of God. See, God will permit you to do certain things, but it's not the perfect will of God. And then the perfect will of God was only for there to be Isaac, but because he decided to sin. Okay. Well, now you have a child with this person. It wasn't my perfect will, but I'll, you know, we'll, we'll make it work. In other words, how many here we've done the wrong thing before and our, our life and our mistake has produced the wrong thing with the wrong person and, and certain things. But God is so good that even in the midst of that mistake, God will turn it around and use it for your good. That is why whatever the devil intended for bad, whatever the world intended for bad, even what you intended for bad for yourself, God can turn it around for his honor and for his glory and he'll make it work. Amen. See, God is so powerful. We put so much limits on God. God will make, he will make whatever work because the Bible says that all things, not some things, not just only the right things you do. It says for all things work out for the good of those that love him. Amen. And it says here. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and, and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba and the water in the skin was used up and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across him at a distance of about bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite of him, lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Talking about Ishmael. Because she got kicked out. She got kicked out from being amongst Abraham and Sarah. So pretty much she becomes a single mother. Isn't that crazy? This is a perfect story for single mothers. The guy knows 
Abraham kicks kicks her out because he's listening to his his wife Sarah get rid and she becomes a single mother with Ishmael and God is saying here hey I I man this is powerful God's like I still got a plan for you <laughs> you know when I was reading this it made me sad for a little bit because his Hagar was by herself you know what it is you you just did whatever they told you to do. You have this child. Now you get kicked out and you're a single mother by yourself with this son, Ishmael, where you don't even have enough to feed him. Dang, just talking about it, it just, I don't know, it makes me a little emotional. Because when I was reading it, I thought about it. It said that, that God was like, Hagar, what's hurting you? Because she's right there and it says she's holding her son. It's like, I don't even have to feed him because she was a single mother. And what does he says? Arise, lift him up, for I will make him a great nation. And it says here, then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. <laughs> so God provided a way where there's no way because they didn't have she didn't have no more water. And God created a well. <laughs> In the middle of nowhere of the wilderness, God created a well for her to be able to take care of her child. So this is a perfect story for single a single mother. That in the middle of your wilderness, in the middle of you being by yourself, and then you in the middle of you being kicked out and abandoned by people who should have stayed by your side and helped you raise your kid, well, God will make a well in the wilderness for you. Amen. I've seen it in the in the in the life of my mother when, you know, when her you know with my mother split up with my father. It was difficult, but I seen the hand of the Lord. And this is why God has a special place. That's when people say that, oh, the Bible doesn't talk about everything. Yes, it does. There's right here. It's right here in Genesis. You see an abandoned single mother. And it says here, verse 21, he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him in the land of Egypt. What a good mom getting him a wife. <laughs> and it says, here, and it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and uh, Fekul, the commander of his army spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring or my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and in the land in which you have dwelt. This is so important, what, what's about you about to see happen here. So this Abimelech is the king. He's a king here, right? And, you, and, 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 and look what happens. And Abraham said, I will swear. Then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had seized. So he took a, a land, a piece of land that had a well that belonged to Abraham, and Abraham rebuked them. And as then Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor, I had, uh, nor had I heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep, oxen, and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven... Uh, Ew, lambs of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ill lambs which you have set by themselves? He said, you will take these seven ill lambs from my hand that they may be my witness that I have dug this well. Therefore, he, so they, because they were, like I said, this is why there's war going on. They He wanted to mark what was his, what belonged to him. That is why you, you have, you've had war in Israel since the beginning of time that Abraham was mad because what well, this is the land God promised him. So he said, hey, we're going to put these lambs here to mark what's yours and what's mine. And so therefore he called that place Beersheba because the two of them swore an oath there. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with uh, Pichel, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistine. Philistine? We're going to replace that word. He returned to the land of Palestine. You see that? This is where, once again, the same thing, fighting over this territory. This area is back to the same area that is in Gaza, which right now, today, people want to argue, free Palestine. Oh, that, that line, leave Palestine. This is the land that was promised to Abraham. That, that even since then, Abraham's telling Abimelech, who is a Palestinian king, <laughs> is what you technically is he is. Abimelech 
is really a Palestinian king. And 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 Abraham is saying, bro, this is not yours. This is mine. And he rebuked him. And it says, so they made a covenant. And it says, and they returned. So he returned to the land of Philistine. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. And there he called the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistine many days. Chapter 22. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah. Isn't when I was reading, I was like, his only son. That's not that wasn't his only son because he has Ishmael, right? So that's why some people was like uh, atheists will say, see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. You know, how is it that God is saying to Abraham, go get your only son when he has Ishmael, but. <laughs> People literally grab one thing and run with it and say that, look, there's a contradiction in the Bible. It's not a contradiction because he doesn't have Ishmael anymore. Hagar, his mom, took him and they left. He doesn't have us. He doesn't have him with him anymore. The only son that is there present with him is Isaac. So that's why. So if anyone, because people will argue with that. Oh, see, you know, gosh, is his only son, but he had two sons. See, there's a contradiction, a mistake in the Bible. Not a mistake. If you don't have that son, he didn't have that son no more. He was taken, he was he had to leave. He wasn't part of him no more. Because God had a different plan with him. And it says, Whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So look, look how crazy this is. God promises him and Sarah a child. Imagine God promises you something. The very thing he promises you is the only thing you have. And then God asks you to sacrifice it. This is why sacrifice is, needs to be important to every Christian. Because sometimes God is going to ask you to sacrifice the only thing you have. <laughs> How many have ever been there where you're like, God will ask you, give this up. And you're like, this is all I have. That's why some people are not givers because they're afraid of being empty handed because you think, dang, this is all I have. God tell you, give up where you're living, go move somewhere else. But Lord, this is the only house I have. This is the only place I can live. This is the only place I can afford. God's like, give it up. Well, give up that relationship. But God, no one else is going to want me. Give it up. Give up with it financially, whatever. God, but I'm going to be empty. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay my bill. And God says, give it up. And God's asking Abraham, give up your only son. He already gave up Ishmael. He left. And now he's all he's left is with Isaac, which God promised him. Imagine God gives you a promise and he's asking you to sacrifice the very thing he promised you. Imagine God promises you a successful business. You start the business and then he asks you to sacrifice it. <laughs> and this actually ministers to me because when I, God will still does this today. See, I, I started boxing at the at the age of nine years old. I didn't go to college. I really wasn't in school. All I did was box. I became a professional fighter at, at, at 19 years old. I turned professional. And just when my career started to kind of pick up, the Lord told me, hang it up. I said, Lord, this is all I have. I have no degree. I'm not good at anything else because I never was. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I had no idea what I was going to do. I said, Lord, if I give up boxing, I'm going to give up all the years that I invested, all the connections that I've made, all my hard work. But see, this is what we think. When God asks us to sacrifice, it's not a means of loss. It is a means of gain. It is for you to lose what you have for yourself to gain what God has for you. God's never going to take something from you to leave you with nothing. He's going to take to bless you. When God takes things, people, situations, whatever it is out of your life, it is not a means 
When God takes things away, takes people away, takes situations, opportunities away from you, it is to bless you, not to hurt you, not to leave you empty handed, not to leave you with, oh man, I feel the spirit of God. It's not to leave you with nothing. It is his way of saying, I got something better in store for you. But we're like, Lord, this is all I have. This is the only thing I can get. This is the best I have. This is, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do without it. And God's like, what do you mean you don't know? I'm the one who's asking you to sacrifice it. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? We freak out. What am I going to do when the very person who's asking you to give it up or the sacrifice it is the one who gives everything, who gives it all for you? He'll test you. You want to know why? You want to know why God tests us with sacrifice? Not because he wants to take something from you. To see if you will love that thing more than you love him. That is why the Bible says anyone who loves mother and father or sibling or this more than him is not worthy of him. Listen, you can't love your mother more than you love God. You can't love daddy more than you love God. You can't love your children more than you love God. You can't love your marriage more than God. You can't love your business, your money, your appearance, your fitness, none of these things more than God. And if God says, hang it up and you can't give it up, then you means that that thing is truly your God. And that thing is what you place before God. See, I, you have to reach this point. And this is why. You want, let me ask, let me tell you something. You know what? I, I'm going I'm to I'm stop right here. I'm going to, uh, I just feel I need to talk about this topic. I need to remember that that's where we left off. I just feel like the Holy Spirit is taking me in this direction and, and I want to listen to him. Amen. How many want to see me listen to the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stop because if it's up to me, I want to continue. I want to continue that chapter, but the Holy Spirit is leading me in a different direction. Sacrifice is so important. See, sacrifices need to be made to bless you. Amen. God's never taken things from you, like I said, to leave you empty handed. He wants to see, not that you're willing to sacrifice, but he wants to see that you, that the Lord is your one and true and only love of your life. See, see, when, when God took boxing away from me, it wasn't that God really cared about the boxing. He wanted to see if I would love boxing more than him. He was going to see if I relied on my boxing more than him. He wanted to see if I was going to rely on my career as my means of finances more than him being my means of finances. He wanted to see if boxing was going to be my source of joy or is he going to be my source of joy? Because sometimes we're like, God, if you take this away, I'm not going to be happy no more. God, if you take this person away, I'm not going to not going to feel good anymore. God, if you take this away from me, I'm really not going to enjoy life like that no more. And if any of these things are a source in our life, God is going to ask you to sacrifice it, not because he necessarily wants it gone from your life or not necessarily because it's a bad thing in your life, but because it's how you're going about it. He wants to see if you, if any of these things are a source to you and not because he wants them to be resources, but not a source. Going to the gym and feeling good that is a resource. But if that is the only time you feel good about yourself, that has become a source and God doesn't like that. See, God may ask you, stop going to the gym. You say, well, well what, why? Because you've made that thing a source of your happiness, a source of therapy for yourself instead of God being the source and that thing just being a resource. And some some of us will go to think that's what drugs are for. <laughs> see, the, so, see, we condemn. Oh man, the Lord is taking me in this direction. See, we condemn people who pop pills and, and drink and drink wine at night because that makes them feel better. But there's some things that we do that has has we made it into a drug in our life. You made you made fitness in the gym a drug in your life. You made whatever it is being you know a drug a thing in your life that that whenever you're stressed out and overwhelmed that that's the thing you run to instead of running to Christ. It's, that's why God may ask you to sacrifice it, not because what you're doing is a sin, but how you're going about it is becoming a sin. Amen? That's why the Bible says all things are permissible, but not all things are helpful. Amen? So if every time I'm having a rough day, I grab my guns and I go to the shooting range, is that a bad thing? Is that a sinful thing? No. But if I do that, instead of going to the source, it is a sin. Amen? 
If every time I'm alone, I start downloading dating apps and start talking to people, hitting up my ex and, and start talking so I can feel better, but that becomes an idol in my life. So God will ask you to sacrifice it, not because he wants to see you empty handed, because he wants to see truly who's number one in your life. Are you really going to trust him? And he'll ask and because and then we'll say to ourselves, but this is God, this is the only thing I have. How could I give this up? It's all I have. See, when I when I when when the Lord told me to hang up my, my boxing career and to you know how many people were mad that has known me since I was a little boy? And they said, Why are you throwing away all your years that you invested? I had no youth. I didn't hang out with friends. I never, you know, I never been to a club. I've never been to parties. I never did any of that stuff. I was always in the boxing gym. That's all I did. So when the Lord told me, hang it up, I said, Lord, this is all I have. The Lord is like, really? I thought I was all that you have. <laughs> it, that's an, And we will do that with God. God, give up my house. That's all I have. And God's going to say, I thought, I, I thought I was all that you have. God, give up the friends, this relationship. That's the only friend I have. That's the only that's the only person who wants me. Or really? That's the only person who wants you? That's the only person you're in a relationship with? <laughs> See, God is testing our loyalty and our love towards him and our obedience. That's why the Bible says he desires obedience over sacrifice. But see, what 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 made Abraham, which we, 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 we would have went to it, do it? God didn't really care about the sacrifice. You want to know why he didn't care about the sacrifice? Because when we're going to continue to read, he doesn't he doesn't even end up he doesn't even end up sacrificing him. So did God really want the sacrifice? He wanted the obedience. Amen. So God is not interested in seeing you lose things and really lose all the stuff. He wants your obedience. That you say, God, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do that. God, if that's what you're requiring of me, God, if that's what you're asking of me, I love you so much, I'll do it. Because you know why? Sacrifice, sometimes when we're thinking about sacrifice, it becomes really a sacrifice. But obedience should be your desire. Amen? It should be, think about it. Would you want somebody to stop doing certain things and that they're like, oh, I'm going to sacrifice this for this person? Would you want somebody to do something... They're like, I'm going to obey you because I love you. Amen. Would you like it if your spouse was like, oh, I'm not going to the gym today. I can't believe I have to cancel the gym today so I can go and have a date with my wife. Would you, <laughs> ladies, how many, would you like that your man sends you a text and says, hey, I'm not going to the gym today. I really, oh, I really want to be at the gym, but it's just because I, want, I, I guess I have to be on a date with you, but whatever, sac I need to make this sacrifice. You ladies, I don't want this date. <laughs> If you see going on a date with me as a sacrifice, stay at the gym. <laughs> How many could say amen? You would say no, that the person's like, I want to do this. I don't want to be at the I want to be with you because I love you. That's how Christ wants us to be. God, you want me to give up this job? I'll hang it up in a heartbeat because I love you. God tells you to move. God, I'll give up this house. I'll sell my stuff. I love you, Lord, whatever you tell me to do. So when I when the Lord told me hang up boxing, I had a lot of people mad at me. Uh, what are you going to do with your life now? I said I have no idea. What I said I have no idea. I guess I'm gonna. Go, I guess I'll be flipping burgers at Burger King. And like, because listen, I, I've been on the newspaper in my country. I've been on. I've been on TV before. All this stuff, and, and I was heading in a good direction. And God said, hang it up. And what did I do? I hung it up. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I had no idea what I was going to go. I said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I said, my friends are the, the people that were hoping that I'd become something one day in boxing are probably now going to pull up at the drive through it. And I'm going to be like, mild or spicy? <laughs> you want it grilled or crispy? And God had other plans. See when I, when God asked me to do it and I sacrificed, I did it and I didn't pick it up again. And I obeyed him. 
obedience brings reward. So soon as I hung it up, God brought me rewards. That to this day, I'm enjoying more fruit of my obedience than I ever did from boxing because my reward is not tied to what I have or who I have in my life. My reward is tied to my obedience to Jesus Christ. And we need to grab this mindset as Christians to stop seeing sacrifice as losses. Isn't this crazy? If I said church on Sundays at 6 a.m., people say, well, I guess I'll make the sacrifice. Why, you, why do you see it as a sacrifice? Why don't you see it as obedience that brings reward? Oh, I got to make the sacrifice and fast. See, what if you did it for the weight loss, you'll see it as a reward. Oh, my stomach will be flat today. But for Christ, it's a sacrifice. We need to start seeing things as obedience, and obedience brings reward. Blessings come into your life because God graces on your life. He'll bless you anyways. Reward comes only from obedience. So whenever God, you know, is trying to do something in your life, notice that you'll lose things, lose people. He'll ask you to sacrifice certain things, sacrifice your time, sacrifice different things. But believe me, it's not about a means of loss. It is a means of gain because God wants to really see, is he truly number one in your life? And I'll say this, God <laughs> is such a jealous God that he don't only want to just see you as he wants to just be number one. He wants to be number two, number three, number four, because nobody should be that close. Yeah, but people say, oh, you know, God's number one. My family's number two. Nah, God's number one. He's number two, number three, number four, number five, number six. My family and, and everyone's probably number 10 because nobody should be that close. Amen? Because he's my everything. That is why God said, you can't love anything or anyone more than him. Because the minute that you do, you're not worthy of him. Because it become, because if, if you love anything that much, that'll be the very reason why you stop loving him and obeying him. And God will take anything and anyone out of your life if it's going to mean that that thing will get in the way between you and him. Because if, it's not just about someone getting in between you and him because God just wants you all to himself. But because if he, if that thing or person gets in the way of you and him, they're getting in the way of your salvation. That's the bigger picture that we don't notice. God takes things in, it's like I said, things, people, situations, whatever, away, because that thing might get in the way of your salvation. And God loves you too much to lose you forever. So next time you lose things in your life, sacrifices that are made, it's because God wants to catapult you towards reward and blessing and obedience and more, so much more for your life. It's not a means of loss. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So we'll continue on with Gen uh, the rest of that chapter of Genesis. I, I had to go in that direction. The Holy Spirit told me to just focus on that. Amen. Because I believe a lot of things that are going to come for our life, a lot of things that the Lord wants to do in our life, it's going to be some sacrifices that got to get made. But it's not for loss. It's for gain. It's for blessing. It's for reward. And we're going to see that when we continue on next Thursday. We're going to see what God does when God asks him to sacrifice Isaac. You'll see how the Lord bless them. Amen.